Um, do you agree with that texter, Andy, who says Labour have no policies and uh, we might get a shock when time goes on? We've had uh, Professor Sir John Curtis, who is the sort of doyen of political prediction. He's a, he's a, a sophologist who says that there is a 99% chance of a Labour government after the next election. Yeah, yeah, he made it fairly clear that in his opinion it's a well-respected opinion that Labour are going to have a, a pretty easy run at the next election but I think it's untrue to say that they don't have any policies obviously they don't have specific policies lined out because you know the election hasn't been called the manifesto. No the Tories to steal them all. Well exactly you know like uh, the non-dom like non non tax yeah. that was something that they really built on really established and then the Tories nicked it in the budget. Uh, when the election is called I'm sure the full manifesto will be written out and all the policies they, they always say be through, out. They always sort of say through gritted teeth we're absolutely delighted the government has <laughs> yeah. adopted this policy. Um, look it's interesting that the front page of the Daily Mail, an exclusive poll for them, saying that Labour is more trusted on defence than the Tories. Uh, people now associate Conservatives with cutting military spending. We've had quite a lot of reaction to that already on the programme. Uh, what do you make of that? Well, I was trying to find out the difference between Labour and Tory on defence, and I found a speech given by John Healy earlier this year. Shadow Defence Secretary. Shadow Defence Secretary, exactly, talking about the introduction of a new military strategic headquarters, uh, the creation of a new role to do with military uh, procurement, but no further commitments on spending whatsoever, and presumably that's because they need the intelligence in order to be able to... Budget they need to look at the books, really, yeah, and exactly. that's that's always very difficult because the civil service, as we as we all know, will look at that behind the scenes and see how those spending plans will actually work out. But it is it is fascinating that the question is between the Conservatives and Labour Party, which party do you trust more in national security and defence? Conservatives twenty three, Labour thirty four, both equally fourteen percent. Neither party twenty one eight percent don't know. And actually, on the government in particular, is it spending too much, too little, or about the right amount on defence? Too little, 40. Too much, 9. Right amount, 34. What do you make of those findings, Andy? Well, I, I think it, it's really, really interesting for the Labour Party because generally, you know, defence and the economy, it's always been the Conservatives. Law and kind order. Of, it's been their kind of home... It's been their home. But on you know, those three been, it's issues, been... defence, law and order, economy, yeah. Labour are now leading. I mean, I think it, it really does show that the tide has turned fully on the Conservatives, you know, Labour are, uh, somehow they've just kind of let their enemies hang themselves, they've kind of stepped back and just let the Conservatives implode, as the Labour Party did, you know, between 2016 and 19, and it's just just baffling, really, but I think it's just on defence spending, I was reading Dominic Cummings' blog uh, a couple of weeks ago, and he was saying that all the defence spending figures are completely skewed because of class classified spending, they can't include it in the public right. reports, yeah, yeah. so, uh, you know, it, it's always one of those, that I'm sure there's other things going on in the behind the scenes, but, God, yeah, the polls are absolutely incredible. I, I couldn't believe it when I read it this morning. Although maybe it's just inevitable that on all these issues, you know, if Labour are so far ahead in the polls, they're bound to be ahead on individual issues. Johnny's been in touch on WhatsApp, actually, 0344 499 1000 is the WhatsApp number. He says, hi, Peter, NATO is not equipped to fight Russia, as it's not as united as would seem. And if America pulled from NATO, which is more than possible, put, although, well, I mean, Donald Trump says he's committed to, to NATO, um, and Biden is certainly committed anyway. Uh, Johnny continues, if uh, America pulled from NATO, which is more than possible, Putin will look to reap the revenge on Europe as a whole and the show of absolute force showing America how exactly how powerful Macron needs to keep his mouth shut and realise NATO is a united force. He also says, great show, Peter. Well, thank you very much indeed. Um, let's uh, talk about another story here. I want to get your opinion on this, uh, Luke. This is another idea. This is from the Daily Telegraph that Tory MPs are planning for migrant crime league tables. Migrant nationalities with the highest rate of crime will be revealed in league tables under plans to be considered by ministers. Is this a good idea? No, it's a racist one. I do think that when you uh, propose something which would involve an individual's visa or asylum claim being judged more harshly because of where they're from, that is a racist policy. There's no two ways about it. I do think it's also completely wrong-headed in terms of what they're trying to achieve in policy terms. So this is clearly targeted at concerns around specific immigrant groups partic committing particular kinds of crime. I mean, that really should be a job for the National Crime Agency to be concerned with, not, with the, uh, not necessarily with the Home Office around immigration. Those two things should be distinguished. But look, if you look around the most recent headline-grabbing cases, you know, um, 
Mr. Azadi, the uh, alkaline attacker, I mean, he was turned down twice for asylum mm. uh, before a judge then granted his application. The problem there wasn't with scrutiny over his application. The application was refused twice. Similarly, with the, we saw with the Liverpool bomber, the bomber who uh, many people forget about, who de detonated a bomb outside a maternity ward in Liverpool, he had his application for asylum mm. refused twice, but the Home Office couldn't kick him out. So the problem here, the problems with our asylum system are very deep rooted. Um, and but this policy, the idea that we would effectively treat certain visa or asylum claims more harshly because of where a particular applicant is from, mm. that would be completely wrong-headed morally and in terms of policy. And I think we have to call it what it is. It uh, would be so racist. Some U.S. states and Denmark do this. The crime rates of those from Kuwait, Tunisia, Lebanon, Somalia are far higher than those of Danish nationals, uh, and the Danish people know about that because this uh, happens. What do you make of this policy, Andy? I mean, I, I'm all for data collection and data analysis, but I think, uh, as you said, if it were to affect people's lives, you know, that weren't involved in the crimes of those people, that would be racist and it would be profiling. You know, in Denmark, I don't think it affects the visa process, does it? I think they just have the statistics by nationality. So I, I think having the statistics by nationality, it's a bit kind of iffy. I'm sure it'll just fuel the far right's hate, honestly. And what they're, but what they're talking about is treating certain applications more harshly and with greater scrutiny based on where people are from. But surely the, the, the data, I, I agree with you that I think this is racist, but I'm just playing devil's advocate for a second. If you are from a certain country, surely there are all sorts of factors in relation to, for example, Somalia, which would be very different from uh, factors in regard to Eritrea, for we example. Can, I can, mean, that yeah. th those, those will influence the asylum process. We can perfectly reasonably recognise that there are certain immigrant communities who are overrepresented when it comes to crime and particularly organised crime. You know, that is a real problem. Yeah, um, but that doesn't and should not translate into how we deal with asylum and visa applications yeah. from everyday citizens and, from those and, countries. And I speak as someone from a background where, in the nineteen seventies, people made all sorts of eighties people made all sorts yeah. of assumptions of people from my background who may well have had absolutely nothing to do with uh, the uh, terrorism that was going on.